thank you. Um, hope everyone's having a good afternoon. Uh, I'm here to talk to you about building resilient and scalable data pipelines uh, by decoupling compute and storage. Um, I'm a software engineer by training, but for the last probably two and a half years, I've been working more as a data engineer, uh, building data pipelines at pure storage, particularly for log analytics. So uh, this talk is not necessarily about our log analytics pipeline per se. It's more about the, the efforts and the uh, characteristics that we had to build into our data pipeline after it went production so that it could stay up and it could be reliably evolved and uh, operationalized. So in numbers, our log analytics pipeline processes one and a half to two million events a second. Um, and in addition to that data that is coming in live, we also do what we call lookbacks that are processing about half to one petabyte of data per day. So we use log analytics for uh, our CI CD processes. So we run tons of tests and we need to group the test failures so that humans don't end up finding the same root causes underneath and spend wasting a lot of time, so our QA team. Um, and building a pipeline that reached this scale was not, in the big scheme of things, was not terribly difficult. What was really, really difficult was to achieve the reliability, the five second SLA and the six nines of reliability. The SLA, obviously we, have to, we wanna process every line that it comes through within five seconds of producing results, and the reliability in this case means that we want to make sure that you know, six nines out of all the lines that go through will get processed by our system and we will not miss them. So like most data pipelines, we, we had you know, different, different cases. And on the left, you see all of our infrastructure that we use for our CI-CD pipeline back two years ago, two and a half years ago. And we used to run about 20,000 tests per day. And uh, the data flows through a set of RCS log servers that then they, ch they centralize the data. So all the data goes to one place from all of our infrastructure. From there, we use uh, Kafka as a message queue. And I'm, again, I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail into how this works, mostly because the talk is about the other aspect of it. But if you care about more details about how this works, uh, we gave a talk last year at Spark AI Summit on you know, just that. Um, so Kafka, we use as a message queue for reliability of any of the services past this stage, uh, go down and Kafka will do some buffering. We use Spark for a lot of uh, filtering of the data and indexing. We have a lot of data flowing through. At this point, it's 18 terabytes. The reason why data grows is because we, uh, we tag all the data that comes in with a bunch of metadata. So it goes in 3x in size. Um, and Spark does a lot of the filtering of the data that we care about because it's expensive to index a lot of the data. And back then, we used to use Elastic. And we didn't need all the data indexed. So Spark does a lot of filtering for us and only sends the data to Elastic that it's going to be queried by the services that we care about. Um, all of this was using one of our products, but that's technically inconsequential for this talk. And we have some about that custom code that was pulling all of this data was being indexed by Elastic and then actually reporting on the interesting things that we care about. Like, hey, this is a duplicate bug. We've seen this before. Uh, no human needs to QA this failure of a test case. Or we have an infrastructure failure. Or there's a performance regression. And somebody should go take a look at this. And Again, standing up this pipeline was not terribly difficult. And in today's world, uh, the pipeline looks different. It's grown a lot in size. Some of the technologies are the same. And even right now, we're in the process of removing our syslog. The amount of data has quadrupled just because our infrastructure on the left has changed. The amount of data that goes down in different stages of the pipeline has also grown because we now have more information about what the kinds of failure look like. And we've had a lot more human input on, on these systems. And, um, the, the, the number of records that Spark processes per second is bigger. Uh, elastic search t t turns out to be too expensive once you end up to index so much data. So we created our own indexing system. But these are just some examples of how our pipeline has had to evolve in order to adapt to our needs. Um, and in addition to that, we also had to implement lookbacks because, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit about this, uh, you know, software crashes and we need to be able to go back in time, fill the gaps. And, um, and also, like, when you're creating streaming pipelines, you don't have all the questions that you want to answer right away, right? You will have questions in the future about data that you have already processed. So you need to have the ability to go back in time and reprocess the data, so more in, like, a batch fashion. Um, the beautiful part about us having a single centralized system for storage where all the data that is coming in goes through one system means that as long as that storage layer is scalable, something like, AWS is S3 layer, uh, you can always just spin up more compute and throw it at that data for the batch jobs without having to impact your, your streaming services, something that you cannot really do with the more uh, 
you know, historical uh, systems like Hadoop, much more difficult at least. Um, so this talk's gonna focus mostly on reliability, scalability, and flexibility, and the things that we've been working on for really the last year to achieve. And um, we, we narrow it down to three aspects. Um, and the first one is software crashes, and you cannot do anything about it. No matter how good you think you are as a developer, and no matter how good your testing is, and your unit tests, and your functional tests, and your integration tests, stuff will break. Can't do anything about it, and in data pipelines, it's no different than just software engineering. So different stages of your pipeline will go down, and you need to plan that from the beginning, right? So how are you going to account for your Kafka cluster going away? How are you going to account for your Spark code, you know, ooming, running out of memory, the executor gets lost, the master decides to do whatever the heck they do, you know? So um, in our case, one of the things that we had to put in every stage of the pipeline was item potency, and it was significant, a significant amount of work right, because now you end up having to deduplicate every stage of the process. Um, but what item potency gets you, and again, from our point of view, because we're working with time series data, we're able to deduplicate data on a time series basis, uh, because we have data down to the, to, the, to the microseconds in our case, so the likelihood of repeatability of data in those scenarios is very, very low. Um, and for different you know, verticals, whether you're working in FinTech or other areas, it might be different, the things that you use to duplicate your data. But item potency gets you uh, the, the ability to just bring up any part of your pipeline again and start from a, a previously known step, right? So as long as you're keeping track of how far you've already processed, just throw some time back farther, start again, and off you go. Um, Kafka, obviously, for the farther stages down in the pipeline allows you to do some buffering. So that also helps, so you don't even have to worry about, can I even keep up with all this kind of throughput? The next thing that uh, we also have, you have to accept from the beginning and just know is growth. Um, each of the stages of your pipeline may grow at different speeds. In just, in our case, grew way faster than we expected it. And that happened really, really quickly. We didn't have a lot of information on what was stuff, the stuff that we were filtering and what was the stuff that we were indexing. So even though we were suddenly ingesting a lot more data, the stuff that was being filtered and indexed was still very little. So ingest, we had to scale our ingest and suddenly it was a firefighting mode. And we had to scale our ingest really, really quickly. And we spent a lot of time there. And then later on, as our system you know, stayed up for longer and uh, our developers and our, our QA engineers were using it much more often, the amount of data that was being indexed and filtered suddenly exponentially grew in like a period of three months. So it, it, I think it went up to like 10x. So suddenly we're like, okay, well, okay, stop the ingest problem, now let's worry about how much we're filtering, how much we're indexing, and let's optimize that part. So um, this is a stage where, you know, and, and there are other reasons, but orchestration really helped us for this. Uh, we use Docker images, containers, and we use Nomad for orchestration. We, um, did not pick Kubernetes, even though everyone's doing that, uh, mostly because we already had uh, an investment in Nomad in, inside our organization, and there were a lot of um, easily pl uh, places where you could easily hook up into a Nomad uh, system. So it was being maintained by another team, so we could just you know, plug into that and work that way. But orchestration allows you to throw more compute resources at every stage of your pipeline that you need, right? Um, whether you're doing uh, a lot of uh, the steps of our pipeline are completely server serverless, so data is just streaming through them. So you can spin up as many of those systems as you want. Uh, Kafka, having high number of partitions, allows you to have really high number of consumers, a part of a consumer group. So that also allows you to scale that part of your data pipeline very, very easily. So orchestration allowed us to plan for scalability in a, in a very, very quick fashion. And the last one was efficiency and flexibility. Um, there's so many different application stacks out there to do anything that you want, whether you want to transform the data, aggregate the data, filter it, index it, you name it. There is some Apache project probably to solve that one problem. And it is super easy to get that started. Like you go read a web page and suddenly it's running. Oh, whoops, like now it's solved my problem. And um, what happens is that you end up with a ton of application silos. Um, you have like an Apache Spark cluster, a Kafka cluster, you have uh, you know, Hive store, 
you end up having an influx DB database at some point. We had a rethink database. Oh my God, we had so many of them. It was a little absurd because every little problem is like, oh, this one solves it better than that one, so I'm just going to use that one. And what happens was that um, our use of the underlying resources, whether if you're in the cloud, whether they're EC2 machines, and, and, or whether in our case we were on prem, we're the actual servers, became highly inefficient. Right? You, you, you're not really, you have so many systems that you don't spend that, spend that time tuning each one of them to make sure, oh, I really did give you the right amount of CPU, I really gave you the right amount of memory. So you end up wasting a lot of space in both compute and storage. And the bigger problem was that it increased our operational costs because now there are more places where your pipeline can break. Um, so these, and also when you, now you st take about the, the next step, right, scale. Our, we grew in different, uh, very, very fast speeds in different parts of our pipeline. And it required re-architecting of a given stage. In our case, we, we had to re-architect the indexing part. We decided to not go with Elasticsearch anymore and build our own indexing system because we had a lot of a priori no knowledge of our data. So we did that. And um, when you end up with these application silos, you end up building sometimes uh, fixed resources, whether compute and storage, or you're more on like the you know, EBS kind of model uh, where you have these stamped uh, ways of using resources, that becomes more difficult because you cannot reuse those, those kind of scenarios. So when you uh, decouple both compute and storage completely as much as possible, so uh, think of in AWS the model of EC2 and S3, and not necessarily rely on like local storage, which EBS would be the, the model for AWS, and on-prem is more of a direct attached storage model. Uh, if you work hard, which is, it is hard to make all of the stages of your pipeline fully disaggregated of compute and storage, this gives you tremendous flexibility. It gives you flexibility to scale. So if you have to re-architect and replace one of the technologies, all you have to change is some recipes, right? If you have to um, do, um, you know, add a lot more different applications, your efficiencies can become much better because now you can thin provision everything and as long as you have one pool of storage and one pool of compute, everything can be thin provision in that space and the, whether it's the orchestration and the scheduling system that will make the best use of, of your compute scenarios or whether it's the storage layer underneath that is using, obviously, you know, you're not wasting space and you don't have to worry about, well, is this application gonna need 100 terabytes of drives in each of the machines or like 10, ter whatever the number is. Uh, and you don't have to worry about those kind of inefficiencies. So the coupling computer storage together with orchestration were uh, the really, the really powerful uh, tools for operationalizing. And the last third of this problem was essentially the processes. There is a lot of processes that we had to implement ourselves and we had to force ourselves to follow. If you wanna bring in a new application stack, we monitor everything to Prometheus. And if you wanna bring in a new application stack, you better figure out how you're gonna integrate it with our CI, with, our CI, with Jenkins you better figure out how you're gonna integrate it with our build process. And every new application stack that we bring in, we still don't try to limit our developers. It's a small team of developers, there's only four of us. But um, we have to follow a process and it's literally a checklist. It's like, well, okay, you think you're gonna use a new database. Okay, this is the things that you have to meet to bring it into this operational environment. Because otherwise, the SRE team that is actually running these applications and will get woken up in the middle of the night will not accept it. And um, these are some of the processes that we had to implement from our side to make sure that we could reach those availability and reliability numbers. So here's a list of the technologies that we use in our data pipeline. Uh, and some, most, a lot of these are pretty common. Uh, Docker for containers, Nomad for orchestration. We've, we've settled on Prometheus for monitoring. We've had a really good experience with it. We recently added the Thanos aspect to Prometheus, which is the S3 backend. Uh, to, to allow it to scale to much longer periods of time because as, as our pipeline has been running for longer and longer, we've had to do analysis over much longer periods of time. Uh, Grafana serves for all of our dashboards. Um, we use console for service discovery, comes together with Nomad, Chef for the container build, um, Kafka Manager, great resource for your Kafka, uh, you know, every time you have Kafka problems, and I say every time, not when you have Kafka problems, because every time you will have Kafka problems. Um, Artifactory, it's our image repository for all of our um, Docker images, and we use Ansible for the configuration of your servers, of our servers, uh, together with our DevOps team. So uh, the takeaways, uh, it's item potency, orchestration, and decoupled computer storage have allowed us to really have a reliable, scalable, flexible, and efficient, that's a lot of words, <laughs> data pipeline. 
Um, and that's pretty much it. Any questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.